another edition of our recall visit where we sit down with an author from a recent edition of Dental Economics and dig deeper. So I'm here with Dr. Adam Koppelman, who is a general dentist practicing in New York City and a buddy of mine. What's up, Adam? How you doing? Pleasure to see you. <laughs> My pleasure as well. So you had an article in uh, the October issue of Dental Economics on, a, on an interesting subject, on a controversial subject. The article mm -hmm. is entitled Narrow Diameter Implants Making Impossibilities Realities. Small diameter implants have been a bit controversial in the okay, implant hi. world, right? And and um, you're you're a proud user. Uh, you showcase two really great case studies uh, showing what is possible. Tell me a little bit about where the controversy came from, or or, or why do you think that happened, and and you know what are the place for small diameter implants, and, and you know tell me tell me why they don't deserve all the hate that some people give them. From from what I've read, it seemed like a lot of now with diamond implants replaced without a flap. And that's how they were, that's how they were published as well to do that. And that, that really makes it very clinically, uh, clinical sensitive in, in the hands that you're putting it in. When you do anything flapless, you have a, a much higher margin of error. You're also doing it in much tighter areas where even standard diameter implants have a good or higher probability of failure rate unless you have someone whose hands you know how to graft it and, and manipulate that area. So I think that was the first area that these cases weren't going for those, those standard gold, uh, those slam dunk cases that everyone wanted to do. These are really, really technique sensitive cases. Yeah, and some people had seen push the limits, you know, if the patient didn't want to graft, uh, if there wasn't a lot of bone, you know, buccal resorption and, and whatever it would be, they'd place it off to the palatal and then there'd these, these, you know, buccal cantilevers. I mean, they were, they were unfortunately using small diameter implants in their impossible cases from a, from a lot of standpoints. And, and, you know, I mean, geez, anything would, would be troubled in those situations. They were, using, they were using it as their panacea, their, their magic, magic fairy dust. And, and that's not the case. You still have to treat it just as you would. These are very, very often these cases are some of the harder cases that a dentist is going to do. Yeah. And in your case studies, you show a, a maxillary lateral, lateral incisor, which I think a lot of folks would say, you know, mm -hmm. anterior is beautiful option when you don't have a lot of room between the adjacent teeth. You also mm -hmm. uh, show a, stu a, a really great case in a bicuspid area, right? Yeah. So tell me about that. Do you, do you would you ever consider doing molars? If you do, do you use multiple uh, small diameter implants? Tell me about that. I've done one molar case where I placed two two narrow diameter implants. I was luckily able to get 11 millimeters for both of them. Um, and it really minimized the lateral forces. I think we all know when we're placing implants, the biggest reason of failure is if we're putting too much lateral force on them. So the, the biggest controversy with these narrow diameter is of course they're gonna, they're gonna get hit with the most lateral forces. So as long as you understand physics and understand dentistry and understand occlusal load, you really could manipulate where you're gonna place these. Do I think we should put these into molars every day? No way. But do I think we could place these in anterior cases, bicuspids, maybe splint them to a couple other teeth, minimize lateral load on them and have absolute high success? For sure. They're implants, they're titanium, they're sandblasted with, with the same type of material that all of our other implants are placed and they integrate. Uh, that's Another great. Yeah, I appreciate you being forward thinking and for sharing those, those cases with us. There is no panacea for any therapy, for any material, and having faith in small diameter implants, using them correctly, like you said, using using ones that are treated correctly. I, you use uh, dentatus uh, uh, mm -hmm. implants in your in your uh, article. Right. Dentatus uh, is the one that I found. I've placed other ones as well, and they've worked very nicely. Dentatus had a really cool feature of doing a screw retained crown, especially for the permanent and even for their temporary provisional, which for me was a really cool feature, which the other companies didn't have, but they, the ones that I have, all have worked really, really nicely as well. Yeah, that's a good point. Some of the traditional small diameter implants, the earlier generations, they were just a little, little post sticking up or a little ball and you had to kind of cement a crown on top. So having the option to be screw changed. Exactly. So they, these now have a lot of cross resistance. So, so they resist any type of lateral force a little bit better. An another thing too, I think that now the Amazon into trouble with, they were always promoting immediate loading, which is the second, it's lateral force and immediate loading. Those are the two most worrisome type of implants that we could place. And that was one of their primary reasons to do it. So now we're placing this flaplessly and we're hoping to load these cases. I mean, that's setting up a lot of docs for, for some scary failures. All right. 
Small diameter implants, you gotta believe. Thank you, Dr. Adam Koppelman, for your article. Good to see you, my friend, and uh, take care. Thank you.